Hello brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior, and you are now listening to Buy Their Fruits on the Kingdom Productions Network. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another edition of By Their Fruits. I am your special guest host, the Remnant Warrior, along with, uh, I guess I would be his co-host, uh, John Brisson. And tonight we have an excellent show for you guys, and... I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to my brother John to let him tell you guys all about tonight's episode. Yeah, um first of all we want to give a shout out to uh, Jeremy Stone who uh could not uh make it uh with us. It was supposed to be all three of us this evening in interviewing our guests. So, uh most people uh, are well aware of what's going on with uh Jeremy and his family. Uh so please very much keep them in your prayers right now um as they're Absolutely. going through it. Um so definitely, you know, um keep them uh in your prayers uh as well and if anybody can um help them to possibly yeah. raise some money um as well. Um, Before we start, you mind if we say a quick prayer for them? No, not at all. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before your throne of grace now, and I ask, Lord, that you would please work in the lives of the Stone family. I know that there's a reason for the things that you've allowed them to go through. The past year or so, even longer. I don't know what it is, Lord, but I know that you do, and I know you know what you're doing, and I know whatever the reason is that it is going to glorify your name. I pray that you would strengthen my brother and my sister to be able to get through this time. Lord, we all come together in agreement and stand in the gap for them spiritually to lift them up before you and when we can financially. Lord, I thank you for all the people who did give to help them. And I pray that you would just work in their lives, help them get where they need to be as soon as possible according to your will father i ask all these things in the mighty name of jesus christ our king amen um so tonight's guests we have a very uh dear friend of mine an excellent researcher fellow brother in christ wayne mccroy um from all chemical tech uh revolution um I own all of of Wayne's books. I've read all of them. I've interviewed Wayne um, on his excellent writings that he has done as well, exposing transhumanism, exposing the pandemic, exposing artificial intelligence, exposing the autism epidemic. Um, so, um, you know, it's very, um, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to have you on uh, By Their Fruits, Wayne. Uh, if anybody in the listening audience uh, um has does not know of your work they should um and you know um one of the main things that you do which i appreciate is very similar to my uh form of apologetics which i believe that um hopefully not trying to put words in god's mouth i would never try to do so that he has called me to do which is to preach to uh former occult members and practices of practicers of the new age uh which i myself uh once was um and a lot of what you do within your own work is reading uh these occult works and give a biblical counterpoint and narrative uh you know to those occult works which any christian who um is on the meat not necessarily you know baby christians that are just now become born again or on the milk 
you know, maybe they should stick to reading the Bible, obviously, first and stick to um, building their relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, first. Um, but, you know, for other people who, you know, have the full spiritual armor of God on um, and have a, you know, a, a, a good end understanding uh, of the Bible um, and walk with the Lord, um, you know, it is, is, is we should verse ourselves in the writings of the enemy uh, so that we can understand their polemics and how it's um, being um, woven through uh, society, as Alice Bailey mentioned, externalization of the hierarchy, uh, that they would infiltrate the church with the theosophists have very much done so uh, oh, over uh, the past 80-ish um, uh, to 100 years. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate... Uh, what you do for the body of Christ and what you do for God um, as far as, you know, reading these works, but explaining to New Agers and occultish and even people who are not fellow Christians, um, you know, what they are saying through these esoteric and occult texts, but really, you know, what do they mean and really how does that, um, sometimes it does, uh, rarely, line up with truth or line up with God's word, but most of the time it doesn't. They bent it and manipulate it through eyes to Jesus to try to get whatever they need from it um, and actually throw away what's really taught in the Bible aside, right? Um, so I guess one thing I wanted to, to, to ask you first off um, is do you see through your knowledge of Alice Bailey and the Theosophists and how it's molding into transhumanism, do you see how when Bailey wrote about 2025, the externalization of the hierarchy, when she automatic wrote from demons, uh, would be unveiled to the world? Uh, do you think that could be possible? Do you think that could happen uh, within the next year uh, that finally, you know, um, the B system, uh, you know, will be less of a hazy picture and more of actually coming to fruition on, you know, the television screen? Well, thanks again for having me on. It's a pleasure, gentlemen, to be here for the first time on this podcast. I, I am humbled by your introduction, John. It truly is an honor to be here, and uh, I do appreciate John very much. He is a dear friend and a good fellow warrior in Christ. So that being said, um, yes, I, I foresee um, what we're looking at in society right now. We're seeing all the pieces fall in place. I think they're behind schedule on the timetable they would like to achieve this with, but they're certainly trying to align the pieces. And I think they're getting more pushback than what was anticipated originally here. But we do see this stuff coming to fruition in society around us. So that being said, we need to be weary of it because I totally see transhumanism as the gateway for the Antichrist to step into this reality. And he's been working hard to get here, that being the case. I mean, can we identify what Antichrist is? Because Antichrist has a very broad meaning. Uh, what I would consider Antichrist is alternative Christ. It's an alternative Christ. That's kind of, you know, the, the direction we come from. We're not necessarily looking for, uh, say, you know, something demonic stepping out and saying, blah, blah, you know, I, you know, with horns and stuff like that, like is pictured, most people would picture as the Antichrist being or like an actual person or personage with uh, this cult of personality stepping out and doing all these things described in the Bible exactly in the way that it's presented there, I think it's going to be a little bit more subtle than that and i think the artificial intelligence ties into it and i suspect transhumanism ties into it as well so uh, that being the case we're not sure what we're looking at and <laughs> that's the whole problem what we're given in the book of revelation is a lot of symbolism too uh, so when you you see the symbolism and you understand what's being conveyed there then you can know that we're not gonna exactly recognize it right out of the gate now we might recognize the spirit behind it yeah. but the problem is these these people are very subtle in their workings and these demonic uh, attachments and entities that are trying to manifest here are subtle in their working and they need a willing occupant 
to be in in order to manifest in the way that it needs to to come to fruition here and i see the state of technology and the whole push towards transhumanism and this attachment of mankind to technology as being that gateway through which that this can be achieved so i will always caution people let's be mindful of the tech we need to actually like maybe take some precautions moving forward with the state of technology because this is certainly 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 being used as a gateway for demonic type energies to present themselves into our reality and to manipulate people we've seen this and the whole ultimate goal here is to have the ability to transfer information at the speed of thought they're working on this this is called the internet of thoughts it's a subsystem of the internet of things it's been talked about for a long time and it gets down to actually them being able to uh, subtly get technology into your physical body and into your physical brain to attach your neocortex to the web the greater web and i think a lot of this plays into the whole deception of antichrist think about that now if they have a direct line to your brain that gives them a direct line to your perception so the doors of perception and that's a book i'm sure john's familiar with the doors of perception there are in the control of this system this beast system and it is a system make no mistake about it and we see if with this beast system if it can control your perceptions it could make you believe whatever it wants so whatever deception runs rampant that it could program into your mind and mold into your mind that gives it a type of power that we can't really comprehend and this is something i think we've been warned about within the book of revelation and in the bible itself this actually fills the bill for a lot of things that many of the scholars have been stumped with for a long long time and we're sitting at the precipice of this age of technology here where these things can begin to manifest in a, a truly astounding way and we can actually be molded into this this mode of following this beast system or being engrafted into it because think about this the next big push is central bank digital currencies that's what they're working on right now what does that entail well it's digital currency it's it's something that's non-existent okay it's it's not an actual physical thing you can touch and manipulate and exchange with people it's an electronic ghost in the machine essentially mm -hmm. so you have this central bank digital currency and the big push with this is they want it to be programmable so if you have programmable digital currency what can happen then is they can tell you first of all what you can spend it on what you cannot spend it on how long you have to use it and they can make it disappear at will so whoever's controlling this system can have some type of control and does that not describe almost to the letter the mark of the beast system presented in the book of revelation i would say it largely does so that's why i always will touch on the whole transhumanist aspect of things because that actually has very occult roots as well when you delve back into the past looking at that and how that came to fruition but yes i mean i most certainly could see they're trying to snap these systems in place and alice bailey was an important one here for trying to present the plan mm -hmm. way here which so they literally what, call the plan just like QAnon, trust the plan right yeah. i mean they literally call it the plan i mean is, they did even before we, QAnon even became a thing you know yeah we it, talked it, about this when go ahead jeremy I was just saying, we talked about this in the episode with Gary Wayne, how, you know, the science has occult roots and the scientists back, you know, who came up like Einstein and who came up with the theories that modern science is based on, they were occultists and it's funny as far as revelation goes the the second beast of revelation you know he builds the or he creates the image of the beast he gives the mark of the beast he causes all the people to worship the beast 
and um, I believe it was chapter eight in seven or eight in my first book was about this specific subject of how science and uh, sorcery would come together to create, you know, a golem, the image of the beast, mm -hmm. and bring it to life, uh, or at least make it seem alive. And this AI that we see just <laughs> growing and being pushed upon the public every day I believe is going to play a huge role in both the image of the beast and the beast system itself oh I totally agree with your assessment there and it sounds like uh, you came to a lot of the same conclusions I did because I write about the same things in my books, <laughs> almost verbatim as to how you described it there. Uh, so uh, I think we are seeing the same thing coming to fruition here. I think we recognize it for what it is. There's a spirit behind it, and it's not a spirit of God behind all Absolutely. of this. Absolutely. So that's the important uh, distinction we need to make with this. Because here we are in our modern age. What has happened? Well, the new God of this age is science, quote unquote, science. That's what the people have deified. That's what the people in control have deified. Science. They see that as the be-all, end-all of everything. And it's all based upon fraud. Much of our modern science is based upon fraud. When you go back and you study the works of even those foundational scientists like you're talking about, like Einstein. Einstein lifted most of his work from a guy named Poincaré. Yep. <laughs> Henri Poincaré. So right. a lot of his ideas weren't even original. And then the second thing that comes with that is he just outright dismissed a lot of the basic tenets that were accepted in the late 1800s, early 1900s about the model of physics that we have. And this would be the ether model of physics, which better. John Clash talks about that a lot. What was that? John Clash talks about a lot of that in his videos. I've been watching them this week. Okay. Yeah. Well, th this is the whole point. Uh, so. They, they've kind of discarded the physics model that actually seems to work and they've adopted instead of that model what they've done is they've adopted two separate models they've adopted einstein's relativity models and quantum theory and the two don't jive so they've done everything in their power to try to make them mathematically work together coming up with things ideas man-made reifications like dark matter now originally in einstein's uh, equations and stuff he had to come up with something for this and he called it the cosmological constant so this was the same thing it was just a mathematical number that he was able to plug in to make it work when in reality there's no experimentation or anything or any type of observed physics scientific method. method no no scientific method at all precisely and they've adopted all this stuff wholesale as science same thing could be said for evolution. That's another one of my big pet peeves. There is absolutely nothing to support the notion of evolution whatsoever. And this okay. is what I do on my own programs. If, if people are out there aren't familiar with my work at all, what I do is I take their own words and I dissect them with the very things that they claim that they know how to use. In fact, they will tell you that the weapon of the spirit is reason. Now, us Christians, we call that the sword of the spirit. I use that to desiccate their very own ideas. I use their own reason against them, and it doesn't align. You'll see where they constantly contradict themselves or they talk themselves into a corner with the things that they teach and they believe. So you could shine a bright light on this darkness just by doing that, by applying these their own terms in their own terms against them and pointing out the fallacy in their ways of thinking and in the fraudulent basis upon which they have built the foundations of their teachings. And we have this going on across the board. And like I said, I, I don't know if I said this while we were on air or if it was when we were talking before we came on air. A lot of what is really concerning for me is you get a lot of people who join these secret society groups like the Freemasons, and they don't know what they're getting involved with. They don't know, and by the time they figure it out, it's either too late 
because they've already declared several blood oaths that they won't betray the secrets of the fraternity and they've sworn fealty to the fraternity and put the needs and the wants and the desires of the fraternity ahead of their own or they get to the place where they decide okay i better shut up i, I better not say anything and they just quietly go into the background and when they do that oftentimes they find that things don't go well for them and oftentimes it has to do with the idea of some type of a demonic attachment that has fallen upon them because of their involvement with this organization and most get involved with these organizations with good intentions or under good pretexts and they don't think there's anything fishy going on because if you join the freemasons if you get in the what they call the blue lodge which is the lower level the first three degrees of freemasonry there's not much that really goes on there it's just an old boys club where you you go down to the car dealership to get a square deal and this is the rituals yep it, yeah they do they do some rituals some goofy rituals that, yeah that, that that should open some eyes but if you're someone who's you know uh, gone to church grown up in the church knows the bible you know but for people who don't then they wouldn't see anything wrong with it i don't know if you've come across this in your uh in your research but i found a third category as well and that is people who can't or feel like they can't get out because they have stuff on them the 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 higher ups have blackmail material and you know they've got them on film doing something that could ruin their lives and so that's that's another thing that i found that keeps people you know trapped oh no doubt about it especially when you get into the theater of politics and stuff like that that associates with it as well anybody who gets into some type of a prominent position usually they're they're blackmailable and that's mm -hmm. done oftentimes through these secret society groups People don't realize the true reach that these secret society groups have. They have an immense reach. Think just in terms of the intelligence community in the United States and around the world. CIA, FBI, MI6, all of these different organizations, NSA. All of these organizations, where do you think they got their tactics from? From the secret society groups. Yep. Yes. They're one and the same. They're tied together, and people don't seem to realize that. In fact, you can't even get oftentimes a position within one of the intelligence agencies without belonging to one of these fraternities so uh, that in and of itself should be concerning especially when internationally the freemasons are known to give preferential treatment to each other and, and it's even said in their own books and such that they're supposed to help each other when uh -huh. one of their members is in distress and some of it it says uh, you know even if involved in something criminal you're supposed to help them unless of course it's uh, something like murder or treason i think in the one distinction but if you get higher up in the echelons of freemasonry and you look at some of the the rights that go beyond the 33rd degree of the scottish right that is inclusive there too so uh, they're supposed to help each other and cover well, each something other something like is there no help for the widow's son yep, there like you. That. they That's can signal fair. each other hand gestures to judges to get them out of crimes and to police you have the fraternal brotherhood order of the police as well too many police officers and judges of freemasons um and i mean unlike you know christians where we are supposed to help our brothers and sisters where they're in trouble however if they break the law um you know we're not supposed to help cover up the law that they broke so they could get away with it uh, and we're not supposed yeah. to break the law to begin with um, yeah true you know, yes and let we're supposed to obey the law unless it goes against the law of christ yes exactly and so the thing is is we you know with, within the masons you know oh a brother messed up let's get him out of it where and you know true bible believing christianity for, for practicing you know what, what god uh, commands of us within within his word you know we're called to like you said not break the laws unless the government requires us to break the laws of christ or you know if a brother or sister does commit a crime uh you know we are supposed to uh turn them you know over to the authorities 
Um, and, and there's a lot of instances where that doesn't happen in uh, churches, for example, uh, where the, there's many, there's a lot of uh, covering up of pedophilia, uh, which is a major problem, um, you know, within, I, within various Christian churches. So, I would say if you've gone, if you're someone committing pedophilia, then I have a very hard time believing that you are seriously a member of the body of Christ to begin with. Sure. Um, yeah, I will say um, I believe you. I just I, I was trying to think where uh, um, in the scripture it talks about you know turning um, brothers and sisters over who commit crimes. I know what scripture talks about as far as not doing it you know not going to law talking about suing and whatnot you know handling we're so i mean we're supposed to go we're we're supposed to go by the laws of the of the united states of america though we might disagree with how some of the laws are but for example if like if you if i know for sure that you stole something major let's say it was like grand larceny or something okay and i know it and I have proof, but I don't turn you over. And then someone who's not a Christian finds out that I protected you, you know, from prosecution, um, you know, because of that. Um, now I understand if it's something like it breaks the law of Christ, for example, if, um, you know, l- later on through trials and tribulations, let's say that you did, you know, you, you're a Christian. I'm not going to turn you in for that. Or, or let's say that, um, you, uh, the, the government wanted you to harm somebody and you didn't do it. Like, obviously there's areas within the Bible that that's not the case. Right. But like it's obstruction of justice. If you commit a crime, a knowing crime, uh, you know, and I don't turn you in and I know of it, then I myself committed a crime right then and there too as well. Yeah, and and if you're com- if you're committing a a crime such as stealing, any type of theft is a sin. So whether you turn the person into the government or not, you absolutely are supposed to go before the church. Of course, you know, yes. Um, the Bible says, you know, first to, to go to them privately first and give them a chance to deal with it and then, i would argue you know, unless it's a major crime i guess that these well, needs to be right even to if, even if it's a major crime i think um unless you know of a particular scripture that says i would say like murder that, for example well, yeah. like if you know like i'm talking about something like murder or i'm talking about you have proof you saw it you're a witness <laughs> you know like yeah. like what, what I'm saying, though, is like you give them a chance to turn themselves in. If they don't, then you go and, and, and tell the law or, or, you know, turn them in. Um, but things that aren't like, like murder and things that aren't breaking the law of whatever land you live in. Yeah, I'm talking about that. If, sins, if you see them like run the red light for example or forget to pay for like a candy bar when they had self checkout no i'm not talking about something like that i'm talking about like if it's like murder or rape or molestation or something you know like grand larceny or embezzlement um yeah that's something where you know the law of the land you are supposed to i mean i understand giving them a chance I... for them to turn themselves in but at the same time you know, it depends on the crime. What if they're a serial killer? Yeah, well, I, you know, again, I can see how a crime of passion could be committed by a born again Christian, but I find it hard to believe a born again Christian could be a serial killer. Well, I understand, uh, yes, but there could someone, but I mean, the BTK killer went to his church on a, not on a weekly basis. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I mean, you know, I, it's this thing is, is it's kind of like a. I understand that we have to be. So does Todd Bentley. <laughs> and I understand crimes within the church definitely so that you're supposed to go in front of witnesses. Unless, you know, I would argue, Mark Winger would argue this too, 
molestations happening in the church and it's obvious like that's got to be taken care of right then and there like there ain't no two or three witnesses where like you need to take like they need to be taken care of right then and there okay Listen, like you know like if, you, if anybody's heard my testimony um you know I, I, I know for a fact that it's going on in the church because it happened to me as a child uh again i find i don't know um that's like the difference between committing a sin and willfully living in sin um there's no way for us to judge someone's heart but we are supposed to you know know them by their fruits and um uh, those are definitely not the fruits of a disciple of, of Christ. But we kind of got off I didn't mean to get topic. sidetracked on, on, a, on a discussion <laughs> I, here. I, I did uh, too. On the nuances of whether or not uh, we should follow the laws of the United States. And uh, I'm going to say we are different, though, than the Freemasons. And we're called to do so so that yes. a, a non believer can't point at us and say, okay, so how are you different than the Freemasons who protect their brothers? Okay, yeah. that's the point I'm trying to get, to drive across, as Absolutely. we are called to be different than the world. Okay, Set apart. which got which got me on this in the first place, you know. And there are a lot of Christians that fall short, sadly, that try to cover up the crimes of their fellow brothers and sisters and the crimes of the churches that they attend, and in doing so, put a blemish on Christianity and of of itself to the world because they're not following what they're commanded to do in the Bible. Yeah. Right. I would say to that regard here, as far as following the laws and stuff like that, let common sense prevail. And absolutely. That's absolutely missing in society today is a lot of common sense. But it is sad to say there are many organizations that present themselves as Christian, but many of them sadly are Christian in name only. And a lot of people uh -huh. are putting on facades and false fronts and parading around on Sundays and acting the part let's put it that way so uh, it's it's sad to see that but uh it, it is certainly a problem in a lot of areas and this is something that does blemish christians uh true christians it, it's it puts a black eye on us in a sense it gives us a black eye because they try to equate us with those people that are just the pretenders really walking around with a form of godliness but denying the power thereof That's and right. That's a lot of what goes on in society today. They put on the facade, the veneer, the false front, and they try to play the part and act the part. And in the meantime, they live like hell all week and uh -huh. get to church on Sunday and play the part on Sunday. And that's about it. It's sad. And you see it all over the place in this world. But uh, we are called to be different. And we are called to hold one another up, love thy brother as thyself this kind of thing and we are supposed to extend that kind of love to our brothers but it's one thing to help people and to offer them the benefit of the doubt but pattern recognition is another thing altogether and if you see a pattern going on and you recognize it like you were saying you know them by their fruits if their fruits aren't aligned with what is right then you know that it's not christ <laughs> let's put it that way uh, so, uh, at any rate, uh, that's what my two cents are on it. Looks like Jeremy's <laughs> picture timed out or something on us here, John. Yes. So, uh, Wayne, let me ask you. Um, so, are you seeing a lot of... Because um, I know that you reread re uh, Manly Peace Hall, Secret Destiny uh, of America um on your on your uh, channel recently and i was listening to it because of fourth of july and patriotism and all that and the theosophists put a lot of clout into patriotism almost making it in a form of idolatry we saw it with elizabeth claire prophet uh we see it with uh, barbara marks hubbard uh we see it with um and you have like the just a juxtaposition of right wing leaning patriotism and left leaning patriotism right with barbara Mars Hubbard on the left and 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 um uh elizabeth claire prophet on the right and you see with you know guy and julie judy ballard their version of it during the 1930s and the 1940s 
Um, so do you see it kind of playing in of what Manly P. Hall wrote of the secret destiny of America, uh, kind of bringing in the founding fathers, which most of the theosophies glor theosophists glorify them to as well, of kind of like initiating America and those who come into America and kind of, you know, mentioning it as form of manifest destiny, uh, that we are supposed to take command of our destiny, uh, and in doing so, and they always put the veneer you know, doing it within love and light, right? But they don't really necessarily mean that uh, as a way to be um, kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like put it like a adultery of patriotism, which is sadly even infiltrated Christianity and our brothers and sisters that go to church. It seems more and more that they become invested in politics. More and more they come invested in uh, this country. And though, you know, all of us here our American citizens, uh, you know, we have ancestry in this country. It's not that we don't have a certain amount of reverence for our ancestors as far as, you know, you know, living here in this country and, and, and being God fearing, you know, Americans. But that being said, though, we are supposed to be separate. We are part of the kingdom of God instead of any kingdom down here on earth. So some Christians will say, well, that makes you, you know, you're kind of you know sketchy or a traitor or you're not a patriot enough or anything like that so you know do you see kind of like how patriotism is being weaponized both on a carnal and spiritual level and manly p hall kind of wrote about the destiny of america and how that's kind of infiltrating christian thought now with kind of like this uber patriotism that kind of had a really big injection into american culture and to the christian churches after 9 11. oh i certainly do see some of that going on all i have to say about that is look at what happened surrounding donald trump we have this whole q phenomenon which you know relates to right-wing politics and many within the mainline churches really bought into this. The evangelicals largely support Trump, even though, honestly, he's kind of a scumbag. He always has been. Uh, we all know it. But uh, they, they were fed the line, this is God's guy. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, yes, I'll, I'll admit God does use people that aren't godly to do certain things at certain times throughout the course of history. We've seen this in the biblical narrative. But I, I don't buy it. This was just a little too controlled and contrived. But certainly we see that. We do see this attachment to uh, the churches from the various patriotic aspects of things. So if you look, what does the right wing consist of largely in America right now? If you look at it just from the stereotypical standpoint, it'll be the Christian base. It'll be the patriots. All these things united together. It's usually a Christian pastry, patriot. Uh, oftentimes, they'll they'll use these same types of ways of identifying who is your political right, and they've sadly attached a lot of that ideology to the Q phenomenon that's happened here too, which makes me just roll my eyes. But <laughs> it's a subject for another time. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we do see this injection of patriotic ideas into the church and i think it has had an effect and it does kind of become set up as an idol of sorts so then you have the whole political class steering things with this so it, it's kind of deferring the godly nature of things or things that are related to god and uh, perhaps religious perspective it's handing that over to politics and letting politics play with it I see that a lot. I, I mean, like I said, uh, you just have to look at the whole Trump phenomenon to see that. Like, how could any Christian really support this guy? He, he's been a known and proven liar for a long time. He's flip-flopped on so many different things and they got behind him and there's still people that are supporting him. And I guess uh, from what I understand, I guess he's still leading the pack here for the, the next election somehow in the right wing uh but uh it, it's all political theater by and yes. large and a lot of what's been done is they've really they've caught the people that have some sense of morality left within the church maybe you know what we would call maybe the mainline church most of the people that are christian maybe perhaps in name only they try to maybe kind of uh, follow some of the precepts, but uh, they're kind of wishy-washy in their walk with God. Let's put it that way. 
So you get these people behind somebody like this and they line up behind them and they just all vote in tandem. And this is all politics. This is all the political machine working things. And we have infiltration in the churches. We've had that all along. We have infiltration in politics. And the problem is it's the same people at the top pulling the strings in both of those different theaters. And I say theater and I, I mean theater. It, it's all for show. Like, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. But what we can do to protect ourselves from that is, you know, stay strong in the word, read our word, read the Absolutely. word of God, stay strong in our walk. That's the most important thing. Just be vigilant, be in prayer constantly as we're advised to do. Walk that close walk with God, ask forgiveness daily. We have to renew our minds and our spirits daily with this. And so it's not just a, you know, once saved, always saved type of a thing as many people would like to believe. And I believe once you you do ask for salvation from Jesus Christ, he's He's going to give you that salvation. He's going to offer you that free gift. But it's something you have to maintain. If you truly let him into your heart, you want to maintain that relationship. And it is a relationship. And that's something that supersedes all religion or all philosophy or all these different things, politics, you name it. It's that relationship. It's having that one-on-one -on -one connection with God yourself and walking that walk and doing what you know is right. Because the Holy Spirit will lead you. You'll know in your heart what's right and what's wrong yes. if you have that close walk so it's not even so much that you need to follow along with the rest of the group if you see they're doing something wrong i mean call it out <laughs> that's the whole point yes. if you know something is the wrong thing or you know something's the right thing you you know what to do i live my life by one simple criteria if you know in your heart and your mind and your soul that it's the right thing to do do it and you can't go wrong. God will honor that. And he'll respect that. And I'm proof positive of that. God has worked so many miracles in my life. I, I can't even begin Same to thank him for all of that. He's directed my paths for certain. And, and it's to him I give all the glory for everything. So Same that being the case, uh, you, you have to acknowledge that. If you have that walk with God and you stay strong and you, you try to stay in the word, now, I've been terrible lately about staying in the Word. I need to get back to my Bible reading. It ebbs and flows with all of us sometimes. It's oh, just yeah. sometimes we're way more uh, diligent in our walk with Christ, and sometimes we fall short due to the world or due to our own flesh. Um, and well, we're all imperfect beings, and that's why we need. True, yes. <laughs> Even in the New Agers think that you can co-create with God, or you can be a, uh, a God or be God, which is completely silly when you look at how <laughs> imperfect human beings are, and how yeah. you know every single one of us has been, and the only difference is the Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's crazy when you listen to them. And, yeah, and, and that's absolute proof that the NAR and Word of Faith people are New Age um, because they constantly are preaching from the pulpit how they are little gods. You know, uh, they use the term I am for themselves. Yep. You know, they believe that they are on the same level as Jesus Christ. And you said something earlier, John, uh, about us being citizens of the United States and, uh, you know, uh, having a certain amount of respect for uh, our country and, you know, our, our ancestors and whatnot. And I agree, but I have a little bit, well, actually, uh, I have a lot different point of view than most people because I've learned something in my life. Um, I used to be from the age of 17, I was a, I, I was tremendously patriotic. I listened to Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity every single day. Me too. Um, you know, I, I thought George Bush walk, Jr. walked on water. 
um, I got in almost physical fights with people who would, you know, say things about 9-11 being an inside job. Um, you know, I, those were fighting words to me. And I was the most patriotic person I knew. And I was the only person in high school I knew that listened to AM political talk radio. And I, I continued on that path after I came to Christ. And it, even after I first I was ordained as a minister, um, I still had a lot of that patriotic uh spirit and it is a spirit uh attached to me and i held a lot of those beliefs and it wasn't until i got in the word and wanted to know the truth no matter what it cost me you know even if it cost me my belief in jesus altogether i just wanted the truth so I put all my preconceived notions and, you know, doctrinal beliefs aside, everything I was taught, you know, in the church growing up, in seminary, everything, I just tried my best to put it out of my mind. And I read, you know, Matthew to Revelation. And I, I read the whole Bible, but specifically Matthew to Revelation as much as I could, especially the teachings of Jesus. And what I found, and it wasn't long after that that I found the early Antinicene fathers, and what I found was that, of course, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles did not line up with a lot of the things that I had been taught. Yep. Uh, you know, doctrinally, eschatology wise. Um, and then when I started reading the Anti Nicene Fathers and seeing how all of and seeing how the Bible, how we were promised persecution and tribulation, and how you know, we are not greater than our master, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he went through <laughs> persecution and tribulation and suffering that we'll never be able to understand. Yep. And then I saw how the early church, when they were suffering, they were, the their faith was at its strongest the martyrdom of polycarp is a perfect example um and there are a lot of accounts of martyrs throughout the anti-nicene period and their faith was amazing and then when the persecution stopped and Christianity became the state religion. Their faith and their theology went to hell. And the same, I mean, it's a perfect parallel to America. You know, here we have all this freedom and all this these things that we are used to as Americans. We think that they are basic human rights that everyone is, you know, uh, supposed to have. Yep. And that is not a biblical worldview. Nope. After the fall, Satan took dominion of this earth. And because of man's rebellion and sin, God pronounced certain judgments. And the only way to get out of 
those judgments is through Jesus Christ. But even becoming born again and grafted into the Israel of God does not make it where you will not suffer in this life. It actually guarantees your suffering in mm -hmm. this life. Yep. Our blessed hope is not, you know, uh, money and uh, miracles and all the things that the, you know, signs and wonders when I say miracles, all the things that the NAR preach and promise. That's what the devil wants you to believe. And anytime I've talked to people about this, you know, I, I hear this all the time. Well, if you hate America so bad, why don't you leave? Well, if I had the ability to, I would. And I'm not just saying that. If I had a way to, you know, go preach the gospel around the world tomorrow, I'd leave and go preach the gospel. You know, my children, all but one, are grown. And even if it meant my life, I want that relationship with God that I know for a fact that the freedom I have and the comfort I have here in America is holding me back from. Now, does it mean you can't have a strong relationship with Christ if you live here? No, it doesn't mean that. Um, but the some people want to hold. No, I was going to say some people want to hold on. Like America's falling as the rest of the world's falling as we're moving into the end times, right? As the it's yeah. clear in scripture that's what happens. You know, the evil abounds, the love the love love of many grows cold, right? And so but, obviously that's happening. And people are like, you know, they're like, I don't want to be persecuted. I want my comfy life. I'm going to exactly. hold off to the Great Reset as much as I possibly can. I want to return to Americana. I'll do whatever necessary to achieve that. But the thing is, no matter where you live, if you're born again, you are now a citizen of the New Jerusalem, the kingdom yeah. of heaven. Yeah. and an ambassador of that kingdom and its king. And whatever country you're living in, you are just a sojourner, as the Bible says. You're an alien in a foreign land. Um, you know, you were born into that country in this physical body. So, yes, uh, you are a citizen, but you can't control that. You can control making the decision to be born again you know uh, coming into the kingdom of god and once you come into that kingdom you should truly commit to being an ambassador for christ and his kingdom mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i i know I, I said a lot but i said all that to say that that the freedom and comfort that Americans and Westerners have been given is not it, it, it's not something that makes us stronger spiritually it it's a it's not a help it's a hindrance yeah yeah I, I mean no, I, I agree I agree um here's a question put forth that when I you know I ask y'all um, and a question I want to ask anybody who's listening. Do you think it's biblical to pledge allegiance to the United States of America? No, absolutely not. It's, I don't believe it is either. I think we're supposed to swear no oath but to God. What do no you say, Wayne? No oaths. Well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, we've been indoctrinated with this stuff from an early age. Now, uh, when we were in elementary school, we would stand and put our hand on mm -hmm. our heart. And pledge allegiance to the flag every day. And pledging your allegiance to the flag is not the same as pledging allegiance to this country or, you know, to, to God himself. 
think about that. You know what a flag is? It's a it's a symbol. It's a symbol of something else. Okay, it's a representation. It's an image, a false image. Remember that term, image. It's called a uh, what do they call a flag officially? It's not a symbol. It might be like a a a signet or something. If you look up the banner, the, actual, a t the term that they use for it, I'm trying to remember exactly. But if you look up the meaning of it, it's it's not something. It doesn't represent what you think it does. And especially if you look at the American flag and notice that it's got the little yellow fringes on it. Well, that's an admiralty, admiralty maritime law flag that you're pledging allegiance to if that happens to be hanging in your, your school system or your courthouse. Uh, and I assure you it's in the courthouse, the, the one with the yellow fringe on it. Uh, so it's something entirely different. It's an image that represents something else. And when you're pledging allegiance to that image, well, what do we know about false images? Is that not a type of idol? And I think this goes hand in hand with what John was saying before about how they've gotten the church and this patriotic type movement to go hand in hand together. Now, am I saying America's terrible? No, I'm not saying America's terrible. We have an awful lot of freedoms here that other places in the world don't. The problem is when you have this culture of abundance like we have here and this culture where we have these freedoms and these abundances it creates complacent men and if you're complacent you just go along to get along and that's not my problem or that's above my pay grade this is the attitude you take on uh, somebody should do something about that but it's not me though because then i'd have to step out of my comfort zone to do something yes. uh, this is the whole attitude that people take on and it's like, oh, not my problem, or, you know, let's uh, push it down the road, not worry about that today. That's what we pay the politicians to worry about, and this kind of thing. And it just, it shirks your responsibility. And in shirking your responsibility, you shirk your sovereignty, and you shirk your relationship with God, your right relationship with God. So it comes down to, you have to have this compunction in your heart take personal liability and responsibility for your actions and for the things you do. And if you see an injustice in the world, you should do something to correct that rather than sit complacently by and let somebody else handle it. That's kind of how I got to where I am today. I looked around at the state of the world and I'm like, somebody needs to warn people about this. Somebody should do something. Well, why not me? Why not me? Who's going to who's going to stand in the gap for my kids? Sure ain't going to be some stranger that has their best interests in mind. I'll stand yeah. in the gap for my kids. I want my children to have a future. I don't want them to have to live through some type of an unimaginable, uh, you know, uh, technocratic hellscape or something like that, like many of these people have in mind for us. I want them to have a future. I want them to have goodness. I want them to have right living in the eyes of God. I want them to have uh, a, a place that's worth living in. So, you know, that being the case, it comes down to that. Be the change you want to see in this world. That's where it begins. We can only change one person's mind in this entire world, and that's our own. That's right. Think about that. You can only change your own mind, but we are, we are given this task by God, though. We're to go out and plant seeds. That's what we're to do. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. We're just there to plant the seed. And how we do that, it's different for each person. I'm not called to the same thing you're called to, Jeremy. I'm not called to the same exact thing you are, John. Although you and I, John, have similar types of uh, uh, paths, it would seem, at certain yeah. times. But uh, it's not the same thing for everybody. And, and, you know, God puts us in a position where he'll use our talents and he'll use our abilities to try to get the message out there, try to get those seeds planted. But That's once right. the seeds planted, we need to walk away. That's not our job anymore to let that seed develop. Now, maybe at some point it will be part of our job to nurture that and bring that along. But that's different for each person as well. But essentially, yes. what we have to do is we have to sow the seeds. We have to let people know that a lot of what they're seeing happening in this society, first of all, this has been a very, very long-term plan by dark occultists in positions of power who run things in this world. And 
there are absolutely dark occultists at the top of the power structure in this world that are running things. Make no doubt about that. Take that to the bank. Uh, so that's who's running the show. And the things that they do with this quote unquote secret knowledge that they have, which they have withheld certain knowledges from the public. Let's be honest about it, they have. But the things that they do with that, you need to understand what's their strategies. What are they doing? Why do they do it? What are their belief systems? No good general would walk onto a battlefield without first studying his enemy, knowing what his tactics are, what his beliefs are, what his strategies are, what his goals are. And it's the same with this spiritual war we're in. And make no doubt about it, we're in a spiritual war. And it's it's, oh, getting, yes. it's getting hot and heavy now. Uh, we're, we're really approaching the time where the devil is, he's in panic mode. Let's put it that way. He's in full-blown panic mode because he knows his time is short. So he's throwing every trick in the book out there, every dirty trick you could think of. And we need to be able to stand in that day. We need to put on the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the enemy. And not only Absolutely. do we need to stand against it, we need to go on the attack with the sword of the spirit. And that's what's been kind of my personal goal here. Uh, and that's the thing, though. People don't understand the whole armor of God. I I've heard so many sermons, and I've even been guilty of preaching sermons that are telling people the wrong thing about the armor of God. It is literally a lifestyle. Uh, you know, <laughs> the shield of faith is something you have if you are walking in faith. If you have faith, and faith is not something that occurs in your mind. It's not a belief that happens in your mind. You know, I can believe or say I believe all day long in Jesus, but if my actions don't show that I believe in him, then it's nothing more than a thought. You know, um, I, the, the best example that I can give on short is like my son has, when he was younger, he would dive off the top bunk of his bunk bed and I wouldn't even know he was going to do it, but he just knew dad would catch him. You know, that's that's faith and that's a childlike faith. And that's what we're called to have. And it's the same with every other part of the armor and our weapon, which is the sword. If you are not in the word, studying the word and using the word. Yeah. Yeah, then you don't have the sword of the spirit. And it's the same with every piece of armor. It's literally a lifestyle.